They will. Okay. So um, our last uh, formal speaker um, is Professor Willy Grissom from the uh, Biotechnology Department of Biology at Zurich. I've known Willy for many years. Actually, he strongly um, influenced my own career by letting me know about someone to do a postdoc with when I wanted to do a postdoc in his lab. Um, um, Willie, I think, is, he has a long list of honors that I won't go through. He's one of the, he's been the uh, director of the European Plant uh, Sciences Organization. Um, he was many years at Berkeley, now in Switzerland. And I think he can, for the plant scientists among us and for this meeting, serve as a model. And I think we'll hear this in his talk because he's really managed to walk the line between very high, very, very high level basic science, but always maintaining a research program that has practical applications for food security, and in this case, his work uh, has applications for food security in the developing world. And so it's managing the two sides that I think we all in the university have to think of. How do we maintain the high basic science, basic research, because that's one of our callings, but maintaining a commitment to the community at large at the same time, not just being stuck in our own labs. And so um, with that introduction, uh, I'd like to ask Willie to give the last talk. Okay. We'll see how, how well I do. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. It's actually really a great pleasure to be here, and it's, it's also very much fun to be back in Israel and, and, and having so many good friends and colleagues here. And uh, sometimes I feel that small countries like Israel and Switzerland have to lead the way and show the big ones what needs to be done. And so, Danny, I hope you're not going to be disappointed, but my, my uh, talk will actually not be very much about my own science. Um, but uh, I want to come back to this issue. I mean, can we still feed the, feed the world? I and mean, it's actually tough now to talk about these issues because um, <clears throat> much of it has already been discussed now in the uh, last day and a half. But Still, I want to come back on some of the issues. Some of it will be reiteration, but I want to re-emphasize the point that, that what I think, you know, we are in an extraordinary time of great concerns, and, and I'm really serious about this. Um, you know, the issue what we have been addressing here is global food security. Water availability has been a big theme here, of course. We haven't talked much about bioenergy and, and global climate change was always sort of on the periphery. But, I mean, especially in Europe, you know, Europe wants to become a bio-based, knowledge-based, knowledge and bio-based economy. And, you know, when we are looking at all of these issues that we have been discussing here in the last couple, um, in the last day and a half, I mean, if you want to be a bio-based economy, um, you have to be also part of of the solution to the challenges that we are that we are facing, and, and here are some of them uh, that you have already heard uh, to, to some extent um, about in the last day and a half, and I call them actually a perfect storm for agricultural deficits. Why is it? What we didn't discuss at this meeting is that that the the stock of staples that we have that we usually have in the world is really at an all-time low. I mean, the current stock of wheat, I think, is less than 30 days. Uh, maize might be a little bit more this year because of, of, of a good harvest last year. You've seen that uh, investments in plant breeding um, and training has been very, very low for several decades, and that's coming back to harm us now. World food prices, and I will briefly mention that, have been low, and now we see sharp increases. Okay, It doesn't, doesn't affect as much, okay? if you think about in the developed world, in Europe, so you spend like six to eight percent of your income on food. You know, some some other places in the country, you spend eighty percent of your income on food. Um, there are, of course, higher standards of living in China and India. We've talked about this. We passed the fifty percent threshold for urbanization. There's actually a lot of interesting things going on. ETH has a very close collaboration with Singapore now on future cities, um, you know, can we think about urban, peri-urban agriculture actually, what is it that we would need to do, what are the solutions here? 
energy prices, demand for biofuels, climate change, and then, of course, I will come back to that a little bit, what I call the GMO crisis in Europe, okay, which, in my opinion, is a serious, serious problem also when we talk about food security in the world. You've seen this graph now many times. Um, we have a growing world population. I'm not actually going to project out to 2050. I won't see that anymore, probably, likely. Um, but think about that, 2050. You know, this is our children that will be facing 9 billion people. And even their children will be facing probably 9 billion, maybe a few, a few of, fewer people, but not much. You know, there's going to be a large population on that planet for a long time that will have to be fed. And we cannot, when we think about agriculture, which we have been doing for thousands of years now, we cannot think in 10, 20, 50 year terms. We have to think in 100, 200, 1,000 year terms. What is it that we have to do to make sure that in 1,000 years from now, people can still do agriculture on this planet? When you see where the, um, where the population growth occurs, um, that is mostly in the developing countries, of course, that has a huge impact on the demand for, for our crops. And, you know, we talked about grains a lot already, but, but it, it's not only grains. I mean, it's essentially all the crops um, that um, are affected of where we need to produce more. And, again, I'm projecting here just the next 20 years. I'm not even projecting up to 2050. I'll try to be realistic here. And, and we have to do that on less land. And these issues have been touched, about, uh, touched upon already several times here now. We've also seen uh, from Philip's talk that, um, the global cereal production, even though it's still going up, um, you see that the annual improvement is actually declining. And that is a very a serious concern, and I will just show you that concern in, in the next slide. So if you think about um, what we are producing now, you know, we are, the, the world cereal production per capita is, is right now about, uh, at about 2,000 kilocalories per day. That's where we are. Okay, that's the fact. And now, if you project that forward and say, you know, if you just keep, if you want to keep that target of 2,000, 2,000 kilocalories, I mean, that's actually how the production has to, has to grow. And that's where we are. You know, that's, that's what I call business as usual. Okay? So how are we actually going to fill that gap, even this gap, in the next in the next 10 years. Okay. That's, to me, is a serious problem. And then if you then project that forward, we need to produce more with less water, less fertilizer, less chemicals. I mean, fertilizer, I mean, like phosphate, we are, you know, this is not an indefinite resource that we eventually, you know, we will be depleting our phosphate, phosphate resource as well. Not much more then, and of course, much more extreme weather. And that's something we haven't really touched upon. I think that, you know, we're all talking about climate change as sort of this gradual, gradual increase, gradual rise in temperature. But what we really haven't considered is that the weather really will probably become much more erratic. I mean, if you go to Africa now and talk to the farmers there, they say, oh, you know, in the past we knew exactly when the rain would start and we would plant. We can't we can't do that anymore because we don't know exactly when the rain is going to come. And so these are issues that, that I think are, are um, extremely concerning. And, and, and in, or, in order to, to really deal with these challenges, we need more efficient breeding technologies. We need better varieties, better locally adapted varieties, and I'll come back to that. And, of course, uh, a sustainable agriculture. Because... The, con the reason this is a concern for me is, uh, you know, if you think about what has not changed today, okay, it's the fact that we still have a lot of hungry people on this planet. And I wanted to show this curve because about 2000, um, you know, the world leaders got together and said, by 2015, we're going to halve the hunger in the world. We're going to bring it down to below 500 million people. And 2011, this is where we are. Okay, so now how are we going to manage to do that in the next five, four years, three years? So that is a big concern because if you put that into context, right, just to put this one billion into context, 
I mean, how would the world react if there were one billion people in the US, Canada, and Europe starving, going hungry? Okay? And if then I would add now China to this, we would be about two billion people, and these are the two billion people who are malnourished, who don't get all the micronutrients that they need. Well, part of the problem, of course, we have discussed it already, is the um, yield in some parts of the world. You see that the global average is going up. In the US, I mean, now this, we're looking at the uh, last uh, 15, 20 years. In the US, I mean, Philip showed that already very nicely. I mean, it's been going up. Significant increases in, in, in South America. China, the increases are actually not that low, and there I don't quite disagree, and it's quite, quite agree with Philip there. I mean, China really is at the limit of what they can produce. They can sort of certainly increase productivity on a per acre basis, uh, per, per acre basis, but not very much. See significant increases in Brazil, but then you also see where, um, where the problems are, and we have already touched upon that um, in the last day and a half. Now, we also have to realize that the society is in transition. And, and again, that is an aspect we have not really discussed to a large extent because eventually we are moving from an oil economy to a bioeconomy. And that's, if you look at the Horizon 2020 program that the EU um, has uh, put up now, I mean, I was actually part of a group to sort of write, write a, a white paper, vision paper for 2020. Uh, Horizon 2020, so, so Europe is putting up 60 billion euros now for um, advancing the bioeconomy. Okay? Now, that's going to have, I mean, moving into the bioeconomy, that's going to have a lot of implication on how we're going to use our land in the future. It has implication on the environment, rural development, agriculture, and how we're actually going to use agricultural feedstocks. And you have heard of, already from, from various speakers um, that these are issues that, that um, we need to be concerned about. Because even the oil economy, which perhaps has, will have lasted by the time we are done with our fossil fuels, you know, will have lasted two to three hundred years, maybe four hundred. Um, you know, that, uh, this is plants that took millions of years to generate these resources that we're burning up in a short time. Now, in addition to that, and that I think is probably perhaps one of the most serious concerns is the rise in commodity prices. I mean, you have seen this, this graph, which is uh, from, from uh, uh, sources here from Brown. I mean, it's up to 2007, but if you look at the newest projects, of course, we had the dip here um, during the um, global, global recession, but the prices are back up. Okay? And, and, and I think no matter how we're going to put it, I mean, the prices will stay there or will, will continue to go, go up. And, and it is very tightly, very tightly coupled to the oil prices as well. Now, even a small country like Switzerland, and now there is some, some German in here, um, even a small country like Switzerland, who prides itself you know, of, its, of its wonderful agriculture, natural resources, and so on, even that country is not independent of food imports. So here you see, actually in red, the um, what the Swiss people need, um, what we produce, how much we export, and how much we import. Okay? And there was actually an interesting article in, in one of the biggest Swiss newspapers in, in, in German, of course, but uh, I translated it here. Uh, in Switzerland, uh, Switzerland, in Brazil, um, uses an equivalent size of its own agricultural area to produce soy in order to import into Switzerland to feed the Swiss animals. So if you think that the cows are all in the Alps on the grass, you're wrong. Okay? It's five percent of the cows produce, not including the pigs. And Switzerland has a lot of pigs, not including the chicken. Okay? So we are importing a lot of food. And I keep telling the Swiss politician, how are you sure that in five years you still have these imports? It's not only Switzerland. It's every, everybody in Europe. Europe is importing food. And Philip has shown it. So how are we sure that 
in five years from now that Brazil is not going to say, or Argentina is not going to say, China and India are much better markets. So I think we have to think about that. Another, another concern that I have um, is, of course, what Jim briefly touched upon, is this diversity of our crops. I mean, if you think about it, since we started agriculture thousands of years ago, cultivated about 7,000 plant species. Now, many of them didn't work out. Okay? But still, today, there's only about 150 of them that are agriculturally relevant. Now, I'm not talking now about your heirloom tomatoes and things like that. You know, I'm really talking about agricultural crops like legumes and grains and so on. And, so on. and of those, 10 provide 95% of the food and feed. Okay? That's where I see that bottom. Now, arguably, with many of my colleagues, they say, no, this is not a problem. You're wrong here. Because, you know, with, with, with 10 crops, we can feed the world. That is true, but there is another dimension coming in, and that is that we are also not only using very few crops, but in these crops we are also losing diversity. So if you, for example, I mean, I'm not going to go through all these, 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 uh, these examples that I put up here, but, but if you like think about it, I mean, there are only a few major rice, these so-called mega varieties that are now grown uh, for rice that are now grown all, all over the world. Okay. In, in China, I mean, there used to be thousands and thousands of different varieties, and, and we're down to few that we grow on our large acreage. And that is not only the case in China or India. I mean, that's also, I mean, you go to Europe. In the Netherlands, they grow four different types of potatoes. That's it. That's the diversity that we have. We all know what that means, because diversity, loss of diversity favors the spread of pathogens, and I was really glad to see that Philip is picking up on that topic and, and, and really uh, trying to address this also at, uh, at the global level. Um, I mean, uh, unfortunately, this has not yet uh, happened. We have no bananas. And the reason that it has not happened is that you all know that. Or if you don't know, I'm going to tell you now that in order to get a banana, it's sprayed between 10 and 12 times so that you can eat a banana in Europe. So what is it that we need to do? I mean, we have to also, of course, think about solution. And one solution is, of course, we need to preserve the varieties that we have. Um, the FAO is, is very concerned about that. I'm going to be there, actually, in a couple of months to, to discuss this topic with them. Because what we are doing now is, is we are preserving our germplasm in Norway, storing it away at minus 20 degrees. Of course, that's an important way of preserving germplasm. But am I to tell you or to tell our children that in 50 years from now, whatever we have stored there is still going to be any good for the agriculture that they will have to do? I don't know that. I don't even know what goes into that fault. Okay? So I think it is important that we preserve gem present, but we have to also provide, from my perspective, better solutions. And one solution could be that we actually capture our diversity, not by storing it at minus 20 degrees, but really trying to find out what diversity is all about. Okay? And one idea that I'm proposing and, and, and uh, have discussed already with many colleagues is that, well, why don't we try to understand the native biodiversity of our crops by actually um, selecting a number of genotypes. I mean, if you just focus on the big crops right now, maize, rice, wheat, they have many ancestral genotypes that are there for each crop. You know, you select a number of them, say 10,000, okay? You would do that, of course, together with a breeder, and then you say, for each genotype, I'm going to spend a million, and for that one million, I try to generate as much information on that, and I will show you in a second what information I actually mean. For each genotype, I get as much information as I can. So that's one million per genotype, and that would be, for these three crops, $30 billion. Now, if I go to a politician, they say, you're crazy. Why would you want to spend $30 billion on, on something like that? Okay. 
And if you think about it, and, and I was actually interested to see the global spending, R&D spending on agriculture that we do, is still annually, that Philip showed in one of the slides, is less than the actual annual budget of the National Institute of Health. So we have to think about where we are putting our priorities. Now, I think this can be done to sort of build a digital, what I call a digital seed bank. You know, understanding our genetic diversity, uh, the, the genetic diversity, what are the bottlenecks. The molecular characterization of diversity is not longer a problem. We know that we can do that. We have the technologies. Um, managing this data is also not a problem. Where the problem still is, is making that connection between the phenotype and the genotype. So understanding what the genes actually do to produce a certain phenotype in the field, and I really mean in the field. So all these data have to be generated together with the breeders from plants growing in the field. The breeders have to tell us in several different locations what is it that you actually want to know about the crop and what information is going to be important for you. Because I am convinced that in 50 years from now, in 100 years from now, breeding is going to look completely different from the way we are doing it today. I predict, and, and, and uh, Jim sort of is moving in that direction, that perhaps in 50 and 100 years, the breeders will pick the genes or even the alleles off the shelf that they need for their breeding programs. So, uh, like... President Obama said a couple of years ago, we have to set our priority right. Um, science is more essential for our prosperity, our health, our environment, our quality of life than it's ever been before. And if you look at this, um, when you, there was actually a very interesting article in uh, Nature that, that, that uh, a couple of years ago sort of pointed out that when you make investments in public, um, in public research and then the investments in agricultural R&D provide the highest return. So you can go year after year, many years, you know, see that if you invest, invest in agricultural research, you have the highest returns. So this is where we are, and, and I think um, this is, if we want to be a, a bioeconomy, we have to, what I would call now, go the fast lane forward. We have to reduce the ecological footprint of agriculture. And so, you know, there was, it was pointed out this morning, we don't have to reduce it, we have to improve it. I think that is actually a very good point. We have to reduce agricultural pollution. So in other words, we have to do more with, with less. Decrease the agricultural demands for fresh water. You've heard about that this morning and adapt our crops, crops to, to a hotter, drier world and, and of course, double the food supply. And the question is, can we do that? Can we improve our plants faster um, than we have um, done it in, in, in the past? I mean, can we actually learn from, from the earlier breeding programs? You have probably all of you have seen this, uh, this slide that our crop plants today are the results of breeding with, with, with gene mutations. I mean, John Dobley showed that, that you know, going from here to here probably required only six major mutations probably a lot of other things also in addition over the time, but, but, but there are major mutations that, that can be essential in uh, improving our, our crops. So the diversity that we see today in the crops is, is really us having sort of manipulated our genome um, for thousands of years already, so the agricultural diversity that you see here. And so I keep telling people, and this is, this is sort of because I always get, you know, this argument, well, well we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be changing our genomes. We shouldn't, you know, deal with what God has created and so on and so on. Well, if you think about it, I mean, we have done that. You know, what we have here, our crop plants are not natural and our pets are not natural. This guy here is natural. If we can say something about natural. So, can we do it? Um, I'm actually quite optimistic. Um, because we have developed a number of technologies now that are available, such as sort of the marker-assisted selection that has really increased the, um, uh, the time, the speed to, to generate new varieties. It actually goes one step further now to um, genome-wide methods that, that uh, allow the breeders actually 
to, to cut down on the time uh, by using, by using uh, functional genomics method, methods to um, develop new varieties. And from my perspective, then, um, gene technology is sort of the uh, logical and consequent next step that we have to use in, in our breeding programs. And, and the reason, I mean, you all know that, shown here, that by conventional breeding, I mean, of course, we can bring in the genes with, that are, we are interested in if they are present in the germplasm. Um, but you get often a lot of um, yield drag. And with gene technology, if we know the gene, if we know its function, if we know how it functions in the plant, um, we can, um, we can, of course, uh, reduce the time, shorten the time, but I'll come back to, to the issue because even now it takes a too, too long because of the regulatory issues um, that, that we are facing. Now, a good example here is UG99. Okay? So the stem rust, that, that is a new um, um, uh, strain that is, that is moving in, in, in the wheat fields now, and where the, the Gates Foundation has put millions of dollars now into breeding new varieties. And yes, we have wheat varieties now that are, have partial, at least partial resistance to UG99, but it has come with a yield drag, 20, 30 percent yield loss. I and mean, Debbie probably knows more about that than, than I do. Um, so, and I think another important point is we don't always have to do everything with our crops, okay, because there are model plants like Arabidopsis that we can use to really understand a lot of the important agricultural traits. Because, and I'm not going to go through them all here, but, but from, from the breeding perspective, there are a number of traits where you can try to understand at least the molecular basis for these traits, and then once you have that understanding, or even the genes, I mean, the pipelines are open now that we can move very efficiently, move these traits from the model plants into the crops. And, and there are plenty of examples now that, uh, um, where this has been shown. I mean, here is, is an example, for example, um, a rice gene that suppresses branching of shoots increases, uh, uh, that, that suppresses branching of shoots but increases branching panicles, the yield goes up 10 percent. Single gene has a significant effect. So, um, from my perspective then, the combination of knowing more about the germplasm that we are actually using, not the one that we are, have in our breeding program, but the diversity that is out there, perhaps with agricultural practices and new breeding methods and biotechnology, yes, I am confident that we will be able to increase um, yields to the levels that are necessary to sustain the uh, food production for even nine or perhaps even 10 million people. Now, if you think about that, uh, the biotech corps have already made a significant contribution to that. I mean, you have all seen um, these graphs that um, that the um, um, production of biotech crops goes up all over the world. Farmers are adopting it at an ever-increasing rate. But if you think about that, there are also only four crops um, that contribute to this increase. And they all come from the private sector, and they only have very few traits. I mean, herbicide tolerance, insect risks. So I mean, that's what we are talking about. Okay. Now, that's why I'm also a little bit critical, because this is not, these are not the crops that we're going to sustain, that, that will sustain our food security, and that will not be the crops that, that we can use in a sustainable agriculture. We have to think about um, new ways and new types of crops. But nevertheless, and that is a fact, is that they have already had some benefit. And then, for example, in 2008, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, of, of um, work that has been done on that. If we, just in 2008, if just to maintain the production levels would have required 6% more agricultural land if we wouldn't have had the crops, the GMO crops available. That is, you know, that they provide a higher yield on a per acreage basis. And in order to 
achieve that yield, we would have had to use without them uh, much more uh, much more land. And of course, it has had a positive impact on the environment. Okay, I mean, you, Philip showed that also in one of his slides today. I mean, the the, um, um, the use of insecticides goes down, has gone down with Bt corn, and not necessarily the use of herbicides that has actually gone up, and that is being criticized, of course. I'm not sure if that's going to be sustainable. Um, but it, it is, overall, there is a positive impact, and I think that also has to be made, uh, the, the public has to be made aware of that, that there is a positive impact. But nevertheless, and, and here I am critical, um, there are the drivers of production increases, but, but novel trades from the public domain will have very little chance to get into our agricultural system if we uh, maintain our current, current regulatory system, both in the U.S. And, and, and in Europe, especially in Europe. Why is that? Okay, the reason is that, that these crops are deliberately declared dangerous by, by, by many GN, NGOs, especially in Europe. Uh, they don't even shy away from personally attacking you. I mean, this is what happened to us two years ago. You know, came during the night to our house, sprayed no GMOs and damaged the, wife, uh, the car of my wife. We have a terrible regulatory system, in, especially in Europe, um, where we are not looking at crops from the equivalent point of view transgenic crops, we're looking at them from the um, uh, precautionary principle point of view. And of course, that has delayed introduction of quite a number of positive traits, like such, for example, golden rice uh, that was developed by my predecessor, Ingo uh, Protucris at the ETH in Zurich, which still is not in the hand of the farmers. 10 years, 12 years after he actually Developed, uh, developed these plants. So, what else is needed? And I'm just going to give you a few more examples now. Um, what uh, I think we can do, and in my perspective, gene technology will have to play a role in what we do in agriculture in the fu future. Um, just to give you an idea, we need to increase crop resistance to pathogens and reduce to reduce pesticide applications. Um, this is just an example of a, of a big problem we have in Switzerland, is fire blight, okay? What do they do? They spray streptomycin in their environment. But you, even though the government has said no, streptomycin is forbidden, but they make exceptions because there is no other possibility to control the disease, although we have transgenic apple trees that are resistant to fire blight. No, we're going to use streptomycin. BSF has developed a phytophthora resistant tomato. They just took it out of the European market because they said, you know, we can't deal with all that opposition against GMO. Here we have a potato that greatly reduces pesticide input. I mean, you have to spray a potato with fungicides between six to ten times during the growing season in order to get a potato. Keep thinking about that. Okay? Here you have a phytophthora resistant to paint, uh, potato now that you that uses one perhaps two sprays in order to um, to produce a tomato. We ourselves uh, this give you a little bit of also what we are doing at ETH Zurich. We battle against plant viruses, focusing on cassava. We have developed uh, cassava now resistant to cassava mosaic disease and cassava brown streak. Um, disease. These are big diseases that are sweeping through Africa right now, um, really um, crippling in, in parts of Africa, crippling the cassava production. And what, from my perspective, is also most important, it's not only that we in Switzerland, you know, generate these transgenic plants, but we also have to help our colleagues in Africa to implement the technology there. And uh, Sagan had already pointed out what we are doing together with Becker, we also do this with colleagues in Tanzania and, and, and in South Africa to help them actually establish the technologies in their own labs, in their own institutions, in order to move forward. Um, in, we have to increase resistance to environmental stress. 
I mean, that has been discussed in the literature now quite extensively. There are genes out there that are very interested to control um, drought stress. Uh, there are now a lot of breeding programs actually going on in Simit and, and uh, other places um, where single genes are being used to increase the resistance of um, drought in wheat, and it looks actually very promising. Um, there's already freezing and drought tolerant canola that has been developed. Now, in addition to that, we have to improve agronomic traits. Okay? And here, especially uh, the use of uh, the, um, the use of the more efficient use of nitrogen and, and, and phosphate. And again, genes have been identified that can do that. Okay? So we have to bring these genes into our breeding program. Um, we have already heard about photosynthesis-related genes for maize that can, when you put them into rice, can significantly increase yield. Um, also, from the health point of view, we can make our food more nutritious. This is the example of Cassie Martin, the anthocyanin enriched tomato, that when they do the testing in mice, actually significantly reduces coronary heart disease. I showed you the um, golden rice already. And in our lab, we are working actually on trying to improve the iron content in rice uh, because that is a micronutrient that um, many people in the world are um, deficient of. Uh, there are about 2 billion people that suffer from iron deficiency. The husk actually contains quite a bit of iron, but the polished rice does, does not. So we have uh, actually engineered rice lines now that have about a six-fold increase in iron content. So this is a Photoshop sort of uh, depiction of, of, of what we think the rice is going to look like now. Um, so it does have a higher iron content. We're testing this now in the field, actually with colleagues in Vietnam. Um, we're not quite there yet. We have to probably double it again. We have to get up to 10 to 12 fold in order to get enough iron into the endosperm so that with a single meal of rice, you actually get your daily required amount of iron. So I want to leave you then um, with just a few messages uh, that I think are really uh, key messages. Uh, if we want to be a bioeconomy and if we want to achieve food security, um, we need new crop varieties um, with high and stable yield, with improved nutritional qualities, and they have to be engineered or bred or whatever done uh, with them in a way that we can use them in a long-term sustainable agriculture. For that, we need to, in my opinion, better understand and exploit the phenotypic diversity of our croplands. We need to know at the molecular level what is actually out there and how can we utilize it rather than freezing it at minus 20 degrees for the next 50 years or so. And of course, we need innovative research, efficient breeding, and new technologies, including, in my opinion, gene technology. So, thanks a lot. I know that Israel must and will be part of a solution. And I, I can't think of a better way of uh, finishing, at least from the talk. It's time for one question, and we'll move into the round table. Questions, comments? Yeah, Finn. Uh, you mentioned the time it takes to approve it. The development we've heard about here, the development we've heard about here, the GM, seems to be much faster than the GM space, the GM exactly in the right place, and it's much faster. That seems to be used in this for the unknown. Um, so it's a good thing for this. And, um, well, yeah, that, that's a very good question. To be, to be quite honest, I'm not sure if, if, if there have actually been discussions with the regulators, even in the U.S. I mean, I'm actually very concerned about that. Even in the U.S., I see it's sort of a backlash to, to GMO crops now, especially in the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I don't know. Uh, Debbie, if there have been discussions already with regulators. So if you use the zinc finger technology or tail technology, you know, if you drop genes into place, 
um, will that actually be less of a concern for the regulators? I'm not so sure about that. Okay? I mean, I've heard these arguments already in, in, in Switzerland. Uh, you know, the Ethics Commission for Biotechnology in the non-human area has spoken out and has basically said, you know, we really don't know what we are doing. I mean, you're not taking all that epigenetic level into consideration. And now, you know, there's been, there's been a report that microRNAs from rice actually go into our liver and regulate genes, and we don't really know what we are doing. These are the arguments I'm, I'm hearing. Uh, never mind that we have been growing these crops now for 20 years, and there's not a single, single documented report or evidence that any there has been anybody has been harmed by eating these crops. Okay, so to be quite honest, I don't know um, what argument can be used in Europe to convince the European consumers. Um, I mean, I was very frustrated yesterday when I opened the Swiss news and they are now proposing to even extend the moratorium until 2017, even though they just we just completed a three-year program funded by the Swiss government to, to demonstrate that growing GM crops in the field has no harm on the environment, nothing. Even the Organic Research Institute in Switzerland has grown Bt crops and came to the conclusion it doesn't harm the soil, the soil organisms. Okay? Nevertheless, the politicians go up there and say, oh, but that's good for Swiss agriculture, let's extend the moratorium. You know, all I can do is go out there, talk to people, also appeal to their ethical uh, considerations, and say, you know, it's not, I mean, just because you want to protect agriculture in Switzerland or anywhere else in Europe, you're harming the rest of the world. You're sending the wrong message. And that's I think all of us, I mean, including you in Israel, this is what we have to tell our young generation. I mean, that's what I tell my students. I said, you have to go out and tell the politicians. I mean, these are the old generations. These are the people. We are the people who have created the problems. And you are the ones who have to fix the problem. And so, so they have to really speak up. And, 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 and I can only, you know, to be honest, I, I am optimistic because I talk to the students. And the students are much more open-minded, okay? So we may, we may just have to wait out that generation. Thank you.